All right, let's get started then. My name is Deborah Baskey, and I would like to introduce you to our first NIDAS Engaging Preparedness Communities webinar for 2015. And today's webinar will be talking about the Community Capitals Framework and how it provides a holistic approach that can be used for planning. Our agenda for today, just some quick how-tos on the webinar. We would ask that if you have dialed in for sound that you please mute your telephone. And if you have a question or want to make a comment, the chat box is open. And we have a couple of individuals who are monitoring that and will bring that to our attention so we can address your concerns or questions via that method. To start off with, I'd like to give a few acknowledgments. First of all, behind the scenes, we have Nicole Wall and Tanya Burnett from the National Drought Mitigation Center trying to make sure everything's running smoothly. I'd also like to acknowledge our director of the National Drought Mitigation Center, Mike Hayes, and Mylon Wall, who has really been a contributor and helping us with using the Community Capitals Framework here at the National Drought Mitigation Center. And of course, Viva DeHaza, the Deputy Director of the NIDAS Program Office, and Kathy Bogan, the Communications Specialist from there as well. So for those of you who are new, I would like to just talk just for about a minute about what is NIDAS. NIDA stands for the National Integrated Drought Information System, which was, which was authorized by federal law in 2006 and reauthorized in 2014 for the purpose of improve, improving the nation's capacity to proactively manage drought risks through, through more coordinated monitoring and targeted information dissemination. To help make NIDA happen, um, the governance structure is organized so that there are five technical work working groups, each charged with helping to implement a different part of NIDAS. The Engaging Preparedness Communities Working Group is one of those five groups, and our goal is to really work with entities and communities of all types, whether it's a physical geographic community or a community of practitioners, on planning for drought. I have some exciting news, at least I think it's really exciting for the EPC working group, and that is that with the reauthorization of NIDAS in 2014, we have appointed two new co-chairs for the EPC working group. We have Beth Freeman, who's the regional administrator for FEMA out of Kansas City, Missouri, and Kirsten Lackstrom, who's a research associate with CESA, the Carolinas Integrated Sciences and Assessment Program at the University of South Carolina. So you can look forward to really broadening, us broadening the type of topics that we talk about in this webinar series and making use of their expertise. And with that, I am going to turn things over to Kirsten, my new co-chair, and she will be facilitating the next part of this webinar. Okay, I had to turn myself off mute. Am I coming through? Perfect. Okay, great. Um, so the first, um, um, sorry, I'm looking at the chat box here. The first thing, um, while we get started with the presentation, if um, we're asking people who are on the webinar today to help give us a little bit more information and feedback about how they use public health data um, for planning purposes, um, or since this webinar is focused on health. But um, also later on we'll be asking you a couple other questions about um, future webinars and things which might be of interest to you. Um, so as far as um, this first chat box question, um, if you could tell us how you or your organization is collecting and are using public health data for planning purposes, that's something that we can use to help um, inform our planning and um, developing a future webinar series um, for the Engaging Preparedness Communities Working Group. 
Um, and then we have another poll question coming up um, where you can respond, do you currently use public health data in your work, yes or no? So the poll is closed. Um, we've had uh, about 23 respondents, so we have about a little bit more than half are currently using public health data in your work. All right. Um, and as far as the chat box, if you have specific information you'd like to share um, about how you're using public health data, please go ahead and enter that in the um, chat box for the webinar. Now, can we move on to the next slide, Nicole? Yep, here we go. Okay, so now I wanted to introduce our feature presentation, um, which is Mobilizing Community Capitals for Health in the Face of Climate Change. Um, we're pleased to have Dr. Cornelia Flora and Dr. Jan Flora um, here to give that presentation. Um, Dr. Cornelia Flora has a Ph.D. from Cornell University. Um, she's the Charles F. Curtis Distinguished Professor Emeritus of Sociology, Agriculture, and Life Sciences at Iowa State University and a research scientist at Kansas State University. She's done extensive teaching, research, and um, consulting work with, with the action programs across the United States, Latin America, parts of Africa, and Asia. And Dr. Jan Flora is a research professor of sociology at Kansas State University, professor emeritus at Iowa State University, also has a PhD from Cornell. Um, his research analyzes the relationship of community capitals to economic, community, and sustainable development, um, and has also done extensive research and consulting in um, countries across the world. Um, and they have a book, um, Rural Communities, Legacy and Change, which is coming out in its fifth edition soon. So we welcome um, Dr. Cornelia Flora and Dr. Jan Flora to our webinar series. Um, during the course, and I will say during the course of the webinar, if you all, if the people on the webinar um, participants have questions for the Floras, we will have time for questions and answers after their presentation. So I will be keeping track of those questions and helping to moderate that discussion after their presentation. Well, thank you very much. It's a, this is a very exciting topic for us, and we're ready to move ahead. Assuming that I can be heard, I'm going to um, uh, start right out. Faith or invest. And so our goal in looking at the capitals is a way to try to figure out how we take a holistic view of working in the face of constant change in, in communities. Let's change the slide now. Next. OK, so I mentioned resources is what we're calling capitals. They are resources that are, are available. And then next slide. Click it. And we see that we look at three ends. Why, why do we look at this? It's not that the capitals are ends in themselves but they create a social inclusion. And our definition of social inclusion is vibrant communities. Please don't change it. It's, um, well, you, you can go ahead. Um, social inclusion includes vibrant communities, strong families, healthy people, and successful youth. So it's, it's a very broad definition. It means economic security and healthy ecosystems. And these are, the seven that you've seen up here, are those seven capitals that we have found to be useful for people who are trying to take a holistic point of view. Next slide. Natural capital provides the limits and possibilities for human action. I show a drought. I show a healthy ecosystem. And then there's a picture of the Muir, Muir Glacier in 1941 and where it was in 2004, which basically totally melted. So let's put on the 
hit it again. We mean climate for natural capital, next. Air, next. Water, next. Soil, biodiversity, and next. Landscape. All of these are part of natural capital. And all of these are interconnected to each other. Next slide. What we're looking for with natural capital is healthy and sustainable ecosystems with multiple community benefits. Next. In the face of climate change. Next. Human communities act in concert with the changing natural environment, understanding that what we did in the past won't work. We understand the impact of climate change on all natural capital. And next, those with conflicting uses of natural, natural, natural capital see common solutions to changing climatic conditions to adapt and mediate for the common good. This seeking common ground, one of the things that we're going to see when we turn to human capital is climate change seems to generate a lot of conflict. Next. There is cultural capital, which provides how we see the world, define what has value, and things we think possible to change. Cultural hegemony results in devaluing of the cultural capital, particularly of excluded people. And when I talk of excluded people, I'm particularly talking about um, those with fewer financial and political resources, who tend to bear the brunt of climate change around the world, including that of drought. So let's look at what makes up cultural capital next. The, what, the, this is the Spanish word, cosmovisión, but it's how we see, how we attribute causality. It is how the seen relates to the unseen. So if I think this is happening because someone has sinned, and that's why we're having drought, is very different than saying, well, we're having a drought because there is a lack of, there, there is higher our temperatures on Earth, which are due to human capacity. In other words, we're seeing very, very different attrib attribution of particular uh, shifts. Next. Next includes ways of knowing. How do we know there is change? Uh, and what we found out is experiencing change may not convince us it's actually happening. Uh, and we've also found out that people know about change in ways that are meaningful to select action, and this is why the health is so important. Seeing polar bears on a melting ice flow is not as convincing that this is something to act on until we know because my kid is sick all the time with asthma and didn't used to have it. Next. Food and language, ways of being. How much of our ways of being is carbon, in carbon intensive? How much do we have to drive everywhere? How much do we have to keep our temperatures way high in this cold weather or way low when it's warm? Next. Definition of what can be changed. What we're finding in many of our elected officials, as well as many people saying, yeah, OK, it's climbing. It's, it's temperature may be changing, and temperatures may be going up, but we can't do anything about it. There's nothing we can do. So what can be changed? And part of what we're concerned about with human health is saying, you know, there are things we can do, both to mitigate and adapt to climate change. Next. It means, again, that cultural capital is recognition of it. Next and how we attribute it. Next. So here are what, what we're looking for. Cultural differences are recognized and valued. Next. Ancestral knowledge and language are maintained. And very often we're finding that ancestral knowledge helps us understand ways of adaptation. And that we're tr willing to adapt to climate change by including everyone in the community and listening to each other. Next. Human capital. These are the characteristics and potentials of individuals that are determined by the intersection of nature, which is genetics, and nurture, which is determined by social interactions in the environment. Next. 
health, education, skills, self-esteem, and self-efficacy are all very important in dealing with climate change. And I'm going to put health first because it is something that impacts everybody in a very real way. Uh, sometimes we think if we just educated people, then they and to know about climate change, then they would change their behavior. But we're finding that with things like nutrition, it's not just knowing, it's being in a system where it is possible to make changes. And that's why we're so concerned about, Jen will talk about political capital, in terms of giving people the options to adapt in a helpful manner. It involves skills. And it, it involves self-esteem and self-efficacy, which means I think I can make a difference. Next. Next. What, here's a list of the things that we have seen um, as re, that have been related through, one more, through scientific studies um, to climate change. We have seen a huge increase in upper respiratory diseases, particularly asthma. We've seen an increase in disease vectors, um, mosquitoes, sorry, spelled wrong, um, and particularly related to West Nile virus. The incidence of West Nile virus is increasing remarkably further and further north. Ticks and Lyme disease. Ticks are also find it a lot easier to live where it's warmer and we have cases of Lyme disease increasing. We have a number of new uh, vectors that are present as well. So increased temperature plus increased pollution and unfortunately increased temperature does allow for increased pollution, leads to an increase in heart attacks. And finally, mental health is also influenced by climate change. We see increases in violence, increases in anxiety, increases in depression, and increase in PTSD. What is interesting to me is I wasn't looking at mental health impacts at all when we were doing our research in Latin America, and yet this was being reported by local people as one of the indicators they had of the of impacts of climate change. Next. Okay, uh, this is Jen, and uh, uh, why don't we do the entire slide all at once? I think that might be a little bit easier. Let's try that anyhow. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about social capital first, which is the interactions among individuals that occur with a degree of frequency and comfort. And uh, I'll talk about bonding and bridging social capital on the next slide. Social capital involves uh, a degree of, of human trust. Um, it initially, and then it also uh, requires reciprocity. And reciprocity is not a one-for-one -one equivalence between <clears throat> two people, but rather a feeling that um, one can aid people within the group uh, and when one needs help, that that help will be forthcoming from the group as well. Uh, <clears throat> it's important to have organized groups that build social capital, as does collective identity, uh, which is kind of a higher step. And then finally, um, as the groups have worked together more, um, they're more likely to have a sense of shared future. And then they're ready to work together on, on a specific uh, issue related to climate or to uh, water quality, or et cetera. OK, next slide. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> we think that, that uh, the difference between bridging social capital and bonding social capital is really important. Bonding social capital involves relations within the group and um, and those tend to be uh, redundant relations, multiple relations, and and with great depth. While bridging social capital often invo involves more 
temporary relations and those that are are not uh, they're they're more instrumental kinds of relationships. So <clears throat> if you look in the lower left hand corner, the the question of extreme individualism. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about <clears throat> using an example uh, the Des Moines Water Works effort to reduce nitrates and uh, the effort by the uh, by New York City to do the same thing and compare them. Uh, when we have extreme individualism, that means that uh, farmers in the watershed are um, are essentially growing crops with without any concern for the amount of nitrates that are that are being produced, crops and livestock, I should say. And um, the uh, cities which have maybe uh, drinking water out of uh, <clears throat> out of the river, which that watershed empties into, uh, then are obliged, as in the case of the Des Moines Water Works, to install extremely expensive uh, machines to take out the nitrates. And uh, it costs Des Moines about $7,000 a day when they have to use those machines when nitrate levels are very high. Um, so. Um, then we, if we go up to clientelism, which is high bridging and low bonding, and that means that people within the group don't have very many relations with each other, uh, we see what is happening on the national level where you probably have people in, in political parties who do not uh, ascribe to the climate denial uh, perspective that their leaders are expressive because there is that clientelistic relationship, uh, we don't we, we end up with gridlock. Now, if we go to the lower right hand corner, the strong boundaries, we have the example uh, of what has uh, happened in uh, in the uh, Des Moines uh, area, the Raccoon River watershed and the Des Moines River watershed. And just recently, the Des Moines Water Works uh, filed a suit against uh, the, <clears throat> the drainage districts in three <clears throat> counties that are in those two watersheds, and uh, uh, so that they will do something about uh, decreasing the amount of nitrates that are flowing into the into the uh, rivers, and. Um, so we we end up with strong boundaries, with with uh, strong perspectives and difficulties of bridging uh, among those between those those uh, sharp boundaries. Uh, if we look at uh, what we think is the ideal progressive participation, where you have both high bridging and high bonding, uh, we have the example of New York City and and the Adirondacks where uh, I guess it was about a dozen years ago, they, a decision was made jointly between uh, the city of New York and the mostly dairy farmers in the Adirondacks that rather than uh, buy the expensive machinery that was needed to, um, to uh, uh, treat the water, they would provide payments the city would provide payments to the farmers to reduce their nitrate runoff. And that seems to have worked extremely well. We're not sure what will happen with respect to Des Moines and whether we'll ever get to that point, but um, at least uh, at least we're, it's under discussion and, and issues are being raised. So uh, we're positive in the long run at least about that. Okay, let's go on to the next one. Um, <clears throat> social capital then should lead to imp an improved improved initiative responsibility and adaptability. <clears throat> there should be a shared understanding of climate change and and uh, what is behind water pollution, for instance. Uh, 
it's important to build on internal resources as as we saw was done in the in the New York City example looking for alternative ways to respond to constant changes and that of course is uh, sort of the hallmark of climate change because there are constant changes always going on so um, a lot of it comes back to cultural capital and its intersection with social capital. Uh, some of some of those cultural patterns that that we have developed over the years have to be thrown over, and we need to look at things in a, in a new way. And a loss of a victim mentality. And I think as we look at climate change, for example, we often see. Uh, uh, those people who believe that climate change is happening, some of them are climate pessimists. Um, they feel that we're going to have to sacrifice a huge amount in order to, to deal with this issue. But an alternative way of looking at it is that it's a, it's a whole new uh, economic uh, uh, source for, uh, for increased economic activity, and, and therefore we we uh, need to get rid of the, the victim mentality on both sides of this of this uh, uh, climate change cultural divide. And then last is the loss of the cargo cult mentality, which is has to do with a a, a kind of a blind acceptance of technological change as a solution to our problems. And uh, the folks who want to put up uh, shields to shield the rays of the sun out um, would be an example of that kind of mentality. Okay, on to the next. <clears throat> uh, political capital. Um, political capital is the ability to, of groups to influence standards, regulations, and enforcement of those regulations that determine the distribution of resources and the way they're used. Now that that may sound like a strange way of defining political capital, but we'll see that uh, laws and particularly the implementing regulations are extremely important in in maintaining uh, political capital of one of one type or another. So political capital involves uh, being organized. It involves uh, particularly if you're challenging the orthodoxy, uh, the orthodox political capital, you must accept controversy and build connections which will give people within your group a voice and power when we're talking about those who are trying to change things. Power is people and often you are fighting the power of money. My screen just went blank, but I think it'll come back. Um, I think we ended up on the next next slide. Um, <clears throat> so we'll just keep going. People, uh, so if uh, people have voice and power, it means they share an understanding of climate change and they're organized to work together for a healthy community. Uh, they know and feel comfortable in discussing adaptation to climate change both around powerful people as well as people who are often excluded. So uh, you essentially have to be a good political organizer if you're going to bring about uh, uh, political change and uh, through an emphasis, emphasis on political capital. And then um, access to resources for all has to be part of the political agenda. We have to work on inclusivity and ultimately, that means that democracy thrives. And when we talk about democracy, we're not talking just about voting every two years uh, for people who you had no uh, choice in selecting to be on the ballot, but rather a more grassroots participatory kind of democracy. OK, on to the next. Financial capital. Financial capital, is we generally put it near the end because it's the one that is usually meant when people talk about capital. 
it's the one that's so easily measured. Uh, but if we focus only on financial capital, we're simply not going to uh, understand the complexity of issues and and the com the diversity of of, in, of resources that we have to bring to bear. So if we look at financial capital, certainly if we look at the fossil fuel industry, we see that um, they have a tremendous amount of investment capital. They're, they're able to borrow money. Um, and they're able to use the tax system um, in such a way that our policies are really channeled uh, through those, those uh, tax benefits that they get in the direction of, of uh, the fossil fuel industry. So if we're thinking about um, combating climate change and having a less dependence on, the fossil, on fossil fuels, we probably not only need to reduce those incentives, but we need to establish incentives for uh, behavior that actually benefits the, uh, is, is for the common good. OK, so let's on to the next one. So we need appropriately diverse and healthy economies. Um, that means that we have to have reduced poverty, or another way of saying it is, in a more general sense, is that inequality is is too great, and uh, and that uh, reduces the efficacy of of financial capital as well as the other capitals. Um, <clears throat> increased firm efficiency, and this is of course important as we think of alternative ways of generating. Uh, energy and and uh, electricity, for instance, and I think it's heartening that I've been seeing articles saying that we have now reached the point. I think thanks to China, that um, <clears throat> that um, solar arrays uh, will produce electricity at a, at almost the same uh, cost as uh, fossil fuels will. Uh, increase firm diversity. This obviously is true if you're if you're thinking about uh, reorganizing the economy. You have to have lots of different kinds of firms uh, in the in the private sector, and increased assets of local people that can be invested. And I'm and, and I'm I'm rather pleasantly surprised at how much change is taking place in terms of our of. Uh, utilizing alternative energy sources at a time when we have gridlock at, at, at the national level. So local efforts are extremely important. And built capital is also important. And I'll mention some other uh, activities that, that uh, we could think about, such as solar arrays, wind turbines, and so forth. So what, what we uh, construct has a tremendous impact on what our our outcomes are and tells us what our values are. <clears throat> okay, let's go on to the next one. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, our goals with respect to built capital have to do with uh, physical in infrastructure that will enhance other community capitals. So. Um, that, that built capital should serve multiple users in a carbon neutral way. Uh, they can, it can be locally maintained and improved as conditions change. And one of the things that I think of there is, is with respect to wind turbines, uh, we think that it is much more desirable to have distributive power rather than uh, power that is centralized by by Florida power and light or someone uh, and that will that will make uh, it easier for local people to to uh, maintain those systems uh, it it then would link local people together equitably and I think it's important to note that it isn't simply a matter of of uh, 
installing alternative energy, but we have to think very carefully about how it affects the, the, the least among us because generally uh, global warming has a much greater impact on poor people than others. So that has to be a conscious part of the effort. And finally, it link, links local people, institutions, and businesses to outside ideas and resources. Uh, so there we get bridging social capital again. And I'll turn it back to Cornelia for the sum up. OK, so what we've been trying to do uh, for you is to give a framework of saying, these are all the things that we need to talk about when we're looking at both the impact of drought and when we're looking at how we respond. We've talked about both adaptation and mitigation. And we have argued that all the capitals can be essential for both, and that what we do with one capital will greatly affect all the others. Thank you. Are there questions or? Sure. Um, if people would, I think we have maybe just a minute or two for questions. Um, people can enter those into the chat box. And if we have, uh, I know we don't have a whole lot of time, but um, you know we can maybe forward those onto the floor as too after the webinar if we don't have time to get to all the different questions um, participants might have. Um, I, my question um, was more related to kind of applications of the framework. and. You know, have you worked on um, worked with a specific community on a climate-related question or problem using this framework? And um, you know, how did you go about doing that? We did, and we we started um, actually we worked more with communities in Latin America than in the U.S. Just simply that's sort of where we we began the work. And what we start we started out with the communities looking at their assets. These were generally communities who said, you know, we are impacted. Things are different than they were before. When we plant, it's different. The rain doesn't come in the same way. The, um, there's a whole lot less water in the streams. We're having all these conflicts over water that we never used to have before. So people were saying, we know something is going on. How do we adapt? So we went through and found out what the assets that they had. Then they began to say, which are the most important as we learn to adapt to this changing situation? And by changing situation, it's not only that temperatures are higher. Because when temperatures are higher, all sorts of things change. The plants uh, of evapotranspiration is, is uh, faster. So even if you have the same amount of water, it doesn't go as far. So we began working with them, and what was interesting is they came up with a number of interesting, mainly adaptation strategies, because these were very poor communities. Everything from uh, doing uh, genetic selection with their alpacas, so you could grow better alpaca fur on the same amount of land with fewer animals, um, to changing their cropping systems in, in response to the changing uh, temperature and variability. OK. But it has um, to be. Yeah, there aren't any other questions that I see in the chat box right now. So I might just, um, again, invite people to um, provide those as we continue on through the webinar. And I didn't want to um, shortchange Nicole on time. And she's going to Nicole Wall. She's going to give a presentation about some of the activities going on at the National Drought Mitigation Center related to health. Yes, if, if people want to type in questions, we can answer them individually after the webinar by email. OK, right. And if you all have, um, I don't know if um, Nicole and Deb have this information, but links to any you know, other websites or resources that might be helpful that we can um, direct people towards as well would be great. That's a good point, Kirsten. We'll make sure to do that. And this is Deborah Batke. And I did post a note in the chat box that if you think of other questions throughout it, go ahead and type them in the chat box. And even if we don't get to them during the a lot of time for the webinar, we can keep the chat box open for as long as necessary to, or as long as people have time available to address those. And if we still don't get to them, 
we will make sure to um, respond to them individually or we can even send them out to everyone who's registered on the webinar so that you can see those answers. And I think at this point I will take over and introduce Nicole Wall for our next presentation. We're, we have a little bit of time left, so she's going to do her best to, get, to keep us on track. Nicole Wall is our Public Participation Specialist at the National Drought Mitigation Center. And in addition to being certified in public participation, Nicole has a, a kind of unique background in that she has a master's in anthropology and forensic science. And now she is, I guess, more so focusing on living people rather than <laughs> dead people, and is pursuing a certificate in public health. And so in her, her presentation, she will be talking about drought and implications for public health and how we can tie that back to the community capitals framework and into our planning process. And you're on, Nicole. Well, thanks, Deb, and um, thanks to Neil and um, Jan for their thorough um, presentation. I always enjoy um, hearing from them, and I admire their work that they're doing globally as well now. Um, I'm going to try to get this done in less than 10 minutes, um, but if there are any questions, please go ahead and type them in the chat box, and um, we'll try to address them at the end. Um, so this has been kind of a collaborative effort. Um, as you can see, there's many people listed um, that has helped in this kind of effort of looking at the community capitals framework and, and how it um, fits into drought planning, then also um, how it specifically might affect the health sector. Uh, I'll just go over quickly um, what is drought. Um, I'll mention um, how we've been working on some planning initiatives related to drought and CCF um, and some research work and then also give you um, some case studies. Um, important to note right up front is the importance of organizational partnerships and um, so what you'll see here on this slide is um, the mission of the NDMC which is to reduce societal vulnerability to drought. Um, we've been working on the side with the Heartland Center for Leadership Development um, to help bring in the community piece um, related um, to the community capitals framework and um, drought planning as well. And as you can see, by adding uh, our two organizations together, um, we've been able to develop some um, leadership which is important to note, um, that um, has developed into incorporating climate resiliency into our planning efforts, um, protection of community resources while sustaining community health and prosperity are our goals. And I'm getting a note that you can't see my slides. Is that correct, Deborah? I can, I can see them. OK. Um, Joan, you might want to, since I kind of do the facilitation of the webinars, if you want to um, log out and then go back in, that sometimes helps. So hopefully that will work. Okay, going back to um, the definition of drought. Uh, drought is a persistent and abnormal moisture deficiency, um, which has adverse impacts on a well-defined sector. Um, traditionally, drought is classified by the impacts to those sectors as well. And we categorize or we um, talk about in our center um, through our many efforts um, four different types of drought. And of course, um, today we're kind of focusing on the more socioeconomic um, aspects to drought. Um, this is actually a, a slide that I found interesting. Um, I stole it from Deborah. I'm sure she doesn't mind. Um, she had this in a presentation that she gave in November, and as you can see, this is a hydrological drought um, impact chain and how it kind of, um, the, you have the hydrological drought, as you can see in the yellow oval, um, which then has an impact on all the blue ovals as well. So you'll see um, kind of these, um, what I want to say, these extensive impacts um, perhaps on the egg production 
um, sector, livestock pr production sector, um, water um, stock changes can occur, which then has an impact on forest fires, um, land cover con uh, conversions, and also perhaps urban water supply. Um, these ovals are also connected to maybe health impacts that um, we're not really seeing um, right away during a hydrological drought, but they will end up um, making their appearance sooner or later, um, especially through reduced cal calorie availability, um, issues with water quality and availability, um, energy production, and whatnot. Um, I'm not going to go into um, the community capital's definitions and examples because Obviously, we had the creators on just a few minutes ago, and they did a really fantastic job. Um, and in the essence of time, I think I'll, I'll um, just quickly skip over this slide. This slide was just showing the different types of representatives that might be on a commu um, community planning um, spectrum that is also considering um, climate change and drought in their planning processes. All right, so let's get to the community capital's framework and the various drought impacts. And uh, <laughs> you're probably well aware that in 2012, um, much of the Midwest um, Great Plains were under a um, significant amount of drought, and it happened pretty rapidly. Um, and so by our, our planning group kind of um, tracking that drought and the impacts, we came up with some interesting um, results. Um, our team went ahead and looked at the impact analysis using our Drought Impact Reporter, um, which is a tool that you can find at drought.unl.edu. I would encourage everyone to um, check out that tool. Um, it can be very helpful in terms of tracking impacts to the various sectors. Um, um, described on this slide. Um, from the Great Plains um, analysis of the 2012 drought, um, we found the various impacts um, within the DIR and we linked them to the community capitals framework. Now obviously you can see that financial is going to be um, the largest sector um, impacted because drought is insidious and it, you know, is ranks at the near top of disaster um, declarations and um, just has a huge financial impact. But um, also, um, you see the other um, capital areas being impacted as well or affected. Um, so natural, political, social, um, human, and built being represented. Um, so by looking more closely at um, the impacts in the DIR, um, these were the different types of um, impacts that were reported. Um, and so we've bolded um, kind of the health impacts that you can see. Um, so increased respiratory illnesses, increased heat-related ambulance calls, increased spider bites, specifically the brown recluse. Um, um, farmers being less optimistic, increased in, um, reports of anxi anxiety specific to the ethanol industry as well. Um, and then as we look at social capital, you can see that um, with the water reductions, um, the public um, became more aware, aware through um, various media efforts and um, conservation um, discussions started to take place. Um, also increased demands on volunteer fire and rescue um, were also noted. Um, we bolded uh, decreased hunting opportunities because there are people that actually rely on hunting as a form of nutrition. And so um, when you have that area of the cultural capital impacted, that can also be tied to um, health impacts as well. Um, in natural capital, obviously a decline in rangeland grass production, um, trees susceptible to pests and diseases, um, algae blooms in the ponds, blowing dirt, grass fires, and wildlife deaths can all be attributed to health impacts. 
And this is just an overview of those financial capital impacts noted in 2012 in the Great Plains. Um, built capital and political capital impacts as well. Uh, obviously, if you have wells shutting down, you're going to have less, um, less water, which can impact um, health as well. And I know we're running out of time, so I'm going to just keep going here. Um, this is an interesting um, study that uh, we also found uh, related to the drought in California. Um, the community water center there did a study of um, where the drought was happening at a specific time and how that was linked to also poverty. Um, and so 62% of migrant, um, migrant workers um, are in these um, drought-affected areas. Um, and then also an impact on cattle ranchers um, um, as well. So, and then we see the linkage to the, um, the, the groundwater um, aspect of, of that declining as well. So 90% of residents in California in the Central Valley rely on groundwater for drinking. And so all of this, um, in my mind, is hugely related to health impacts. Um, this is hard to read, but this was an interesting um, California uh, drought and health impact of recent, of last year, where um, the prisoner populations in this uh, San, San Joaquin Valley had to be moved because of the high risk um, of the instance of valley fever, um, which is caused by an airborne fungus. And so imagine the, the cascading impacts from that um, and uh, all the implications that that um, brings about. And so um, this is just, um, I'll end this um, presentation with um, so what can we do? We can um, work uh, more diligently and um, you know, provide more dollars, financial um, capital, to drought planning strategies um, in the capital areas, and um, which can overall lead us um, more towards resiliency and adaptation. And you can see how we have the human capital really focusing on the communication of health risks as well. And this was all kind of um, compiled from our own um, NDMC efforts and our workshop and outreach efforts that we um, were able to kind of uh, draw this map. Um, I would be remiss not to um, mention our great partnerships um, with the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, and all the efforts that they have done in um, trying to mitigate um, for drought in the public health sector. I would encourage you all to check out their publication, When Every Drop Counts. Um, it's a very um, thorough and wonderful guide for public health professionals. They also um, recently have revamped their website, and you'll find a lot of good resources um, on, their, on their drought side of things um, at their website, and I've provided that link um, in the second bullet. Um, so for Conclusions in future research, um, drought impacts all capital areas, and these need to be considered in the planning process. It's important to identify um, committee members and stakeholders that are going to be important to your mission, um, assess the risk and development of mitigation and response strategies um, through various ways of perhaps evaluation and reporting, and to also really understand those impacts that are happening um, before um, during and after drought as well. And so again, um, by being really involved in the drought impact reporter, um, um, I think that is very beneficial to the process. So some of the feedback that we need um, from you and some of your ideas would be, um, how do we come about um, with a better uh, methodology of analysis? Um, how do we make better correlations between drought hazards and the community level capital formation. Um, so how do we make this more empirical? Um, what should the data categories show or not show? And how does this relate to long-term adaptive capacity? Um, we also need to bring out the theory of CCF or just find ways to use it as a tool. And so perhaps integrating it into um, local planning processes, um, drought assessments, exercises can also be helpful as well. 
And with that, I know I'm one minute over, um, but I thank you for your time and listening um, to my presentation. And I would encourage um, you to contact me or anybody else on the webinar if you should have questions. Um, and so I'll turn it over to Deb for conclusion. All right, thank you everyone for hanging in there with us. I know we're a little bit, we're one minute over, so we're going to wrap things up really quickly, um, waiting for the last couple of slides to come up. So to wrap things up, as I said earlier, NIDIS was reauthorized in 2014, and so me, along with your new co-chairs, Beth and Kirsten, are working to establish activities and priorities for the coming year. The Engaging Preparedness Communities Working Group is all about you and what are your interests and what, or, and what are your needs. So we would like to hear from you regarding those. And our final uh, chat box question is, what topics are you most interested in learning more about? Are there specific things related to public health that you want to hear about or um, basically anything else that is related to drought planning? Please let us know. Type it in the chat box as well as any other questions that you have. And um, now that you've attended a webinar, you will be on our mailing list unless, on our mailing list unless you tell us you don't want to be, and we will keep you informed on what's happening with our group. And thank you very much.